Now, if you watch my channel on a regular basis, you will know that a few months ago, I decided to go over to the dark side and train to be an air source heat pump engineer. And do you know that we still offer these courses for free? So if you do want to train to be an air source heat pump engineer and you still want to jump on that and get it for free, then just email us down here with this address and Katie will sort you out with that. Now, during the training, it's mentioned about glycol and antifreeze valves. And I've just got up to the point, finally, finally got there, that I need to fill this air source heat pump system we've got in the classroom downstairs. So, do I fill it with glycol? or do I actually use an antifreeze valve? So I thought, let's do a video and compare the two of them and go through the pros and cons and see which is the best system to use. Am I gonna use glycol or am I gonna use an antifreeze valve? Anyway, let's get on with it and find out which one of these comes out top. Now let's take a look at the glycol first. Now this is a monoethylene glycol made by Fernox. Now this just isn't an antifreeze, so not like the antifreeze you put in your car. This is also an inhibitor and an anti-scalant. So this will protect your heating system and it will also stop it from scaling up. So pretty good bit of liquid by the sounds of it. Now let's have a look at the pros and cons of this liquid. Now we're talking air to water heat pumps in this video, not ground source heat pumps, because if you were installing a ground source heat pump, then you will need glycol in the loop in the ground. Just bear that in mind. Now let's have a look at the cons first. Now, first of all, cost. This stuff is pretty expensive. This 10 litre tub is over a hundred pounds and you're gonna need a lot more than 10 litres of the stuff in your heating system. So cost is a big expense. You're probably gonna need three of these in a standard heating system. Also, it has to be changed every five years. So there's a cost you've got to add on to the customer every five years when it comes to servicing. While we're on servicing, the actual glycol in the system will need to be checked on a regular basis to see whether you need to top it up or not. Because if the customer drains the system and fills it back up with just fresh water, that's not gonna be good for the system. You're gonna to need to add more glycol. And you will need a special bit of equipment to be able to test this water called a refractometer. Easy to say with these teeth in. So what about getting it into the system and what about mixing it with water? You can't just pour this into the heating system like you can with inhibitors and then top it up with water. It don't work like that, this stuff. You've got to mix it first and then it's got to be pumped into the system because this becomes very gloopy and thick. So it doesn't mix that well with just stirring it with a stick. <laughs> you will have to have some way of mixing it and then pumping it into the system to get it to the right viscosity. Now, what about getting this stuff out of the system? Now, this is monoethylene glycol, which is slightly toxic. So you don't wanna be drinking it. You don't wanna be eating or smoking or drinking when you're putting this into the system because it is slightly toxic if you ingest it. But when we come to get rid of it, when we need to drain a system, we can't just put it down the drain because it could cause some problems in uh, the water treatment plant. So we've got to be very careful when we're draining systems when it's got glycol in it. So that's another big con for this liquid is it's hard to get rid of. 
And you don't just want to be tipping this stuff down the drain anyway, do you? Because it's that expensive. Also, if you have an unvented cylinder connected to this air source heat pump like we do, you cannot use this ethanol glycol. You have to use propylene glycol because that is what's used in the food industry. So that's another downside for this. We can't use this one if we've got an unvented cylinder. Now, because this is a thick liquid, is it going to affect its performance? Well, of course it is. <laughs> it's going to affect its flow rate. It's going to affect its way it absorbs heat. And it's going to affect the way it transfers that heat. So if we take this ethylene glycol compared to water, we've got a few differences. Now, the specific heat capacity of this, of 25% in water, will give us 3.93 kilojoules per kilogram per degree C. Now, normal water will give us about 4.2 uh, kilojoules per kilogram per degree C. That means it will need 4,200 joules of energy to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree. Now the density of this will be about 1,018 kilograms per meters cubed, where the density of water is about 1,000 uh, kilograms per meters cubed. So that's how you can see how thick it is. So that means glycol can reduce the kilowatt output of the air source heat pump by about 5%. So because of this, we might have to increase pipe sizes to give us that water to be able to get it to the radiators or the underfloor heating to give out that heat. So that's really another disadvantage is we might have to increase the velocity of the water, we might have to increase the pipe sizing to be able to cope with this little lack of energy which this will absorb and then give out into the heating system. Now the final disadvantage for glycol in an air source heat pump will depend on the manufacturer of the heat pump. Now, if you're gonna put glycol in this one, which is the Daikin monoblock heat pump, we need to put a flow sensor in here and wire it into the board to tell the heat pump that there is actually glycol in the system. Now let's finish off with glycol's biggest plus. So if the power goes off to your air source heat pump and the heat pump cannot work, this liquid within the system will stop the central heating system and your air source heat pump outside from freezing up and absolutely knackering it. Now, dependent upon how much of this glycol you put into the water will depend on what temperature this will actually stop it freezing at. So if you have a 25% glycol to water mix, this will protect the system to minus 10 degrees C outside. And if you do a 50-50 mix, it will go all the way down to minus 33 degrees without freezing, without knackering anything up, and without you having to fill the system back up. Well, replace the system once it has frozen. So that is its massive plus. Now, we've had a look at glycol. Let's take a look at this little thing and find out all about antifreeze valves. So what are these antifreeze valves then? Well, they're pretty much what they say they are. They stop your heat pump from freezing. Now, Depending on the manufacturer of the heat pump will depend on whether you have to put this in or you have to put that in. So you've got to make sure you check with your manufacturer. But most of them, I think, love these little devices. So there's not really many cons to these, only pros. Probably the only con for these are the cost. So these are £100 each or just over £100 each. So they are quite expensive for what they are. So what do they do? Well, basically, they pour water out of here 
when the water within the heating system drops below four degrees C. Well, this one does anyway, because this one says it starts opening at four degrees C and is fully open at uh, three degrees C. Because remember, water starts to freeze at four degrees C. So this is going to protect your heat pump when it goes off. Basically, that's all it is. So you get your power cut, it goes off, your heat pump can't work. So then this will pull the water out of here and stop your heat pump and the pipe work from freezing so it will protect it. So this bit on the top here is the air in. So if it does activate, this needs to be open. And obviously this needs to be put into a position where it will, if it pours water out, it's not going to put it everywhere. So like a soak away in the ground and stuff like that. So positioning's uh, also important. Now, some manufacturers of these say do not insulate them because they want this to be the coldest part of the system. But Condensate Pro make these little jackets, but they call it the Primary Pro System. Dead easy to do, it's split there, so that slides in that way like that. That vent has to be above the insulation there and then you use that sticky black glue stuff to seal that. So you seal it, so it's all done insulated. Now this is about seven quid, so these are seven quid each. So mm, 107 quid plus that I suppose is quite cheap when you think about it. I couldn't believe it when they were 100 quid. How's that 100 quid? Anyway. That's really all you can say about these things. You put them in the flow return from the heat pump outside, and if your water within your heating system drop, starts to drop below four degrees, they open up and pour the water on the floor. Now, the only problem I can see with that is if you've got the elderly and the heat pump knocks off, and this opens in the middle of the night and dumps all the water all over the place, then they might not be able to top it back up. This could be a problem, whereas this stuff, it wouldn't dump it all over the place so they wouldn't have to top it up. They could continue to use the heat pump. That's really the only downside of this I can think of. If you've got somebody who's elderly or not able to top up the heating system and get it all back up and running without calling out an engineer. Because that's going to be a problem if you want to call out an engineer because there isn't many of us at the moment. So that's the anti-freeze valve. Another good piece of kit. But the last thing is we can't just have fresh water flowing around an air source heat pump, can we? Because it's going to be low temperatures and it's going to cause problems with things like bacteria. And also we need inhibitors as well in the system, don't we? Now, what I did find was this. So Sentinel gave me this when I went to install it last year and it's X700. So basically what it does is, it treats bacteria contaminations. So this will be good protection for low temperature central heating systems. Now if that does open and that does dump it all over the floor and you have got wet fresh water going through and you might have to go back and top this stuff up. That's the only downside I can find of that. So who do we think is the winner of this little two horse race? Is it the glycol or is it the antifreeze valve? It's, n it's a no-brainer really, isn't it? It's got to be one of these. Two of these together plus this 200, 250 quid. This stuff could be spending four, five, six hundred quid and then have to do it again five years later on because these should last forever unless they're activated, and you can split these into three sections as well. This comes off and this comes off, so they're quite easily repairable as well. So that's my look at this little competition between glycol and 
this Ansi Freeze valve. So, which one do you think's best? Stick it in the comments down below, guys, and let's see what you think. Anyway, thanks for watching this video, and I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers! But don't forget, you can still do that heat pump course for free. And don't forget, Tomcat Plumbing and Heating Supplies has also opened a shop. I'll uh, leave the email here, so if you want to buy things like flue gas analyzers, you can speak to Kate. Anyway, see ya.